give you an analogy. Let me give you an analogy. Let's go back. So when I teach this stuff, I always use the cookbook analogy because it just it makes so much sense. Um, so if we if we use the analogy of your grandma's cookbook, all right, sitting in your kitchen, and so you, so you got two cookbooks really, right? You got your grandma's cookbook from your mom, and your grandma's cookbook. Well, no, this is how I teach it to the majors too. This isn't dumbing it down at all. This is taking something that's ridiculously obscure and trying to you know wrap our our brains around. Oh, <laughs> oh okay, I will do that. <laughs> All right, so you take um, your grandma's cookbook. Okay, so why am I using a cookbook? First of all, let's let's dig into this analogy for a second. So most cookbooks have like, like a big thick cookbook has a bunch of sections in it, right? So there might be a section for desserts and a section for gravies and a section for dinners, you know. Okay, so when you go into one of those sections and you go to a recipe, that recipe has a series of instructions, right? But now consider this: is your grandma's brownie recipe a brownie? Just think about that for a second. No. No, right? What? What? Is, it's just a piece of paper, right? Her brownie doesn't exist here. Or how about this? If you play music and you look at that sheet music, is that piece of sheet music a song? No. Right. It's just so a sheet of music. It's just a piece of paper. Exactly. Okay. There's a special code in it. We have to know how to read that code and how to express that message. That's why we call it gene expression. So a gene and a, and a recipe and a, and a piece of sheet music are conceptually essentially the same things. We have to express those things or they don't exist in the world. A gene is not a thing. A gene is a potential thing, right? Okay, so we have, and now because oh, we're sexually right. reproducing Horrible. organisms, right? We, we oh, have really a mom and a dad all of our cells have two cookbooks. We have a backup copy, essentially. It's not really a backup copy. It's just two copies of it. So you have your grandma from your dad's side's cookbook and your grandma from your mom's side's cookbook. Okay? And here's the crazy part. Those cookbooks are essentially Xerox copies of each other. Okay? Imagine looking at your dad's mom's brownie recipe. And you see on it, and it says it's made from, you know, it looks like a, a photocopy or a mimeograph from like a 1950s Betty Crocker cookbook that she stole it from. And then she marked it up a little bit. And, you know, maybe she changed, uh, she put a little salt in there, and maybe she added some walnuts to it. And your mom's version of it, you notice, is also the Betty Crocker cookbook from the 1950s, but she didn't edit it at all. She kept the original. Okay, and so you have two copies of brownie. You have two copies of a brownie recipe, but they are slightly different, right? And so that's the idea of our genes. Okay, so we have genes that encode for something like eye color, right? You have a recipe that makes brownie, but not all yeah. brownies are equal, as we all know, right? I mean, if you like brownies, you've had good brownies and you've had bad brownies, <laughs> right? Oh, yes. <laughs> So I personally, I can't stand brownies with walnuts in them. Other people swear by it, right? So who's right and who's wrong? Well, of course, I'm right. Brownies with walnuts are terrible. <laughs> yes, so, they are, of course. 100%. <laughs> no, please don't leave. Oh, <laughs> yeah, now I actually want some brownies myself. So yeah, okay, so when I, so, here, so here's the word. I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna teach you guys some fancy genetic lingo now, now that you understand this, right? That makes perfect sense. Of course it makes sense. You can have variations of recipes. That's intuitive, okay? So here's what I'm gonna tell you. There is no such thing as a gene, right? Just like, and here, I'm gonna blow your mind a little bit. There's no such thing as a brownie recipe. All you have, because when I say, do you have a brownie recipe? You're gonna tell me, well, which one do you want? My grandma on my mom's side or my dad's side, right? There's no such thing as a generic brownie recipe. There's just different versions of them out in the world, right? And so that's the way a gene is. The gene doesn't exist. A gene is a concept. What actually exists is your version of that gene, and that version we call an allele. And there's that fancy Whoa. word you got to learn. Okay? So you have two alleles for each one of your genes, right? And so say if you have green eyes like me, you're going to have two alleles that both have the same recipe. And that's called homozygous. Now you can really start 
bumping up your genetics, right? And if you have, say, um, brown eyes, you might have two copies of the brown gene, or you might have a copy of the brown recipe and the blue recipe. Okay, but here's the thing. If you have a copy of the brown recipe, well, okay, so let's, let's use the analogy again. Let's say you have a copy. Let's say you're making two brownie recipes, and one of the brownie recipes calls for nuts, and the other doesn't, and you mix it all together. Your brownies are unfortunately going to have nuts, even though you have a recipe that has no nuts. But when you mix them together, you got some nuts in there. Okay, and that's what we talk about when we say something's dominant. A dominant trait is the trait that shows up. Okay, <laughs> they're good with nuts. Do you like uh, nuts? Yeah. I, so <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Macadamiums yeah. are the best. Yeah, so, so interestingly, oh, there, there, there's another gene we have for our taste buds. Some people have it, and some people don't. There's a little strip you can buy. And if you, and some of you might have done this in school at some point. There's a little, you get a little piece of paper from your teacher, and you put it in your mouth and you swish it around. And oh my either God, I hate it tastes, it. right, either it tastes like paper, and you're like, "What is this?" Or it's like the worst taste you've ever tasted in your life. It's super bitter. And, I know exactly what you're talking about. I hate it. Stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I love doing this to my students because the best part is the students that don't taste anything, who are convinced they're basically eating paper. When they look at the students that are revolted by it, they immediately think they're lying. Like, oh, like, come on, it can't be that bad. This tastes like nothing. It, it's just, it's amazing how, it's like cilantro. Yes, exactly. Yes. And so um, there, even though there's multiple genes for, for bitterness, um, my take on that is walnuts and Guinness beer are two flavors that are associated with that gene. And so if you can taste the bitterness very strongly in that paper, you hate Guinness beer and you hate walnuts. And that's me. So I, I taste it and it's disgusting. And most of my students, not 100% of them, but most of them that correlate with that agree with that. And then there's people that love Guinness beer and that love walnuts. And I it's like, Guinness I don't even know them. 